Good morning. I'd like to thank the chair for the opportunity to speak. Uh, as far as disclosures, uh, none of these are uh, related uh, per se to this conversation. I guess probably the more important disclosures are I'm a, a bariatric surgeon who's a uh, primary looks after adults. Uh, the operation that I do the most is a sleeve gastrectomy, but I do do some bypasses. Um, what else is important? I do a lot of foregut surgery. It's a, a, a focus of my clinical practice, and I also do a lot of therapeutic endoscopy as well, so that's kind of tempered my view on, on uh, this issue. Gastroesophageal reflux is, uh, is definitely a risk that we're all coming to appreciate after bariatric surgery. And, and what's really important about it now is if you're consenting someone for bariatric surgery, you really have to have that as part of the, the discussion. I think we're all pretty aware that GERD itself is more common after the restrictive procedures like the sleeve gastrectomy or the gastric band um, than the gastric bypass, but it does occur with the gastric bypass. And I'll show some data that's emerging that's really informing our, our thoughts on that. It's important that uh, bariatric care providers uh, who, are, who are looking after patients who have bariatric surgery really understand GERD symptoms and how to manage them effectively. And most of my talk today is really going to be on a kind of a fairly clinical focus. The, the objectives are really to understand how GERD can present after bariatric surgery and describe the diagnostic findings that should be considered when devising your management options and review the therapeutic options that are available to you. So let's start with a case, case of mine, 18-year-old female, BMI is 52. She's three months out from her sleeve gastrectomy and is ecstatic about her weight loss. Um, uh, but she says, you know, I got this postprandial epigastric pain that's, that's bothering me. And she had a remote history of a, a cholecystectomy. So um, we'll go back to the case in a second. But I think this is, I want to spend a fair amount of time on this, on this slide because this is a, this, is, this highlights where a lot of our understanding of GERD is emerging from, and, and I think most of you are probably aware of it, that there's been three randomized control trials that have been published as a five-year follow-up just within the, in the last year. There's the Stampede, and then there's the SM Boss just recently at JAMA, as well as the uh, Sleeve Pass. And those are the, uh, the primary outcomes weren't GERD, but the second, many of the secondary outcomes were. And so... Our understanding of this issue has is, is been greatly enhanced because up until now, we didn't really have any prospect of randomized trials or we're looking specifically at that issue. And so we're formulating a lot of our thoughts on expertise and, and, uh, and, and series. But so we, this is from the SM Boss trial, again, published just here uh, a few months ago. And it was a randomized trial where you had 100 people basically in the sleeve arm and you had 100 people in the room uh, bypass arm. And as far as the comorbidities, again, this is a secondary outcome, but the, uh, f uh, all these patients underwent uh, an evaluation, endoscopy, upper GI, as well as manometry. Uh, and, and so as, as far as their characterization at baseline um, uh, for reflux, you can see in the sleeve gastrectomy arm, 43% of people had gastroesophageal reflux. So gastroesophageal reflux is common uh, in the bariatric population, as we know. In the room of my gastric bypass, it was, it was 46%. I might add that if patients had severe gastroesophageal reflux or had a large hiatal hernia, they were excluded from the trial, and that's important because severity is uh, in, important is, is tempering all these uh, discussions about what is the right thing to do for, for the disease. But let's just look at the sleeve gastrectomy uh, column for, for the ones that, who had, uh, uh, had uh, reflux at baseline. And uh, for, the, for the longest time, so when I've been consulting my, uh, or discussing with my patients, uh, I would say if, if you have reflux, there's a, it's a third, a third, a third. I say there's a 30% there's a th chance it's going to get worse, 30% chance it's going to stay the same, and a 30% chance it's going to get better. Um, so I'm happy to report that what I've been telling patients for, uh, based on my own personal experience is kind of the, the reality as what we're seeing in the, in the randomized uh, clinical trials. As far as the room wide gastric bypass, again, I think this is really important data because this is you know, prospectively uh, uh, acquired data. Uh, again, not specifically looking at reflux, but well captured. And you can start to understand the, the, you know, the role of room, uh, room wide gastric bypass as far as uh, uh, its, uh, its ability to impact uh, uh, gastroesophageal reflux. And you can see that the uh, remission or improved occurred in 66% of patients. So this is a therapy that two-thirds of the time is, is very effective at dealing with gastroesophageal reflux. Um, 
27% of the time it was unchanged, and then in 6% of the time it was actually worse. So it's a, it's a you can think of it as a, uh, a GERD operation that does come uh, with some risks as well. Um, uh, now if we just look at the other group, so there's, there's the, the other group that uh, didn't have gastroesophageal to reflux at, when they underwent the operation, and then what happened to them over the next five years. And you can see that uh, with the sleeve gastrectomy, that a third of them develop new onset uh, uh, GERD. And that is basically you know, documented by needing a PPI, basically. Um, and we'll talk, a, we'll dive into that a little bit more. But you can also see that in the gastric bypass population, 10% of them also uh, developed gastroesophageal reflux. So back to our case. Um, now we're at six months, and despite high dose PPI, so twice a day PPI, uh, this patient uh, still has. Uh, significant symptoms, uh, though they're static, uh, still about their weight loss. And interestingly, from a quality of life, you ask them, would you have your operation again? No question, I'd have my operation. So GERD is something that you have to manage, but in, in my experience, it's, it's seldom uh, something where the, whereby the patient would say, you know, I wish I never had the operation. And I think that's important to, to appreciate. And so the patient that goes in endoscopy, so you take a good look at the uh, esophageal mucosa, the gastric mucosa, and the duodenum mucosa, and in this particular case, there's really nothing there. So that is pause for thought, and then for these patients, there is a, there's, you have to be a clinician here, you have to sit back and think about what else may be going on. And uh, thinking back, uh, postprandial epigastric pain to uh, medical school, I think maybe it's not unreasonable that they have a biliary cause. And that's oftentimes a confounder for GERD-like symptoms. In our case, we did an MRCP and found a stone, then subsequently did an ERCP and uh, took care of it, and that was symptom resolution. So diagnosing uh, uh, GERD is, uh, is interesting when you think, when you kind of frame it for, uh, from a principal's point of view, a, a post-sleeve gastrectomy, that it, it is so common, as we showed, that it's, it's, it's perfectly reasonable empirically to start them on a proton pump inhibitor if they have pain, heartburn, or regurgitation, and that's, that's the way I've practiced. But if they don't respond to that, then they, uh, they definitely need uh, further evaluation, and usually starting with endoscopy is a great way to go, because it, it'll oftentimes take you to the diagnosis. But if it doesn't take you to the diagnosis, you have to broaden your differential and think about other things. And I've certainly seen a couple cases of, of biliary causes over the years that, uh, that basically mask themselves as GERD, if you will. All right, thank you. So uh, second case, um, so at the three-month follow-up visit, another patient that, uh, so despite their high-dose PPI therapy, uh, they're, they're having uh, a significant uh, uh, quality of life impact from, from their GERD. And, and, and GERD therapy should always really be framed in the, in the context of, of quality of life, and that's an important, uh, important um, principle. So this patient underwent endoscopy, and it revealed a gross distal esophagitis, a dilated fundus, and a stenosis at the uh, incisura. And so uh, I bring that up because it's uh, important to, to, I think I skipped over a slide here, but the, um, that when you do find uh, a stenosis um, at, between the vertical and horizontal portion of the sleeve, I mean, you can see that person back into your, uh, your office uh, and discuss what your options are. Your options are going to be, you know, continue on with your current therapy, surgical therapy. But there's, these are a subset of patients that really do benefit from additional endoscopic therapy, namely the uh, dilatation of that stenosis. Now, that may be a stenosis. It may be a twist. It's somewhat not, it's, as far as what, you're, what, what you can offer the patient, uh, it, it really doesn't matter in the sense that it's worth a trial of, of uh, endoscopic dilatation because it is very well tolerated. And I've definitely seen patients who've went through a series of dilatations and went from kind of intolerable gastroesophageal reflux to actually saying, you know, I'm perfectly happy on once a day PPI and I'm great, thank you. And you actually see uh, endoscopic resolution of their, uh, their, their significant uh, esophagitis as well. There's some interesting reports just last year presented at SAGES, which was not only a two centimeter dilatation, but actually using achalasia balloon dilatations up to three and showing another additional subset of patients who basically avoided uh, surgical revision and were happy with their, their GERD outcome. So there are endoscopic options, there's medical options, and then um, 
and then uh, and then there's the, how they present. So I, I, the first two cases are kind of presenting almost in the in the, in the early perioperative period. But there's there's another subset of patients that actually perioperatively don't have any gastroesophageal reflux. But then what happens beyond the, th the third year, they start developing symptoms of gastroesophageal reflux. So you can see regurgitation, heartburn, and their primary care started them on a PPI therapy, and then you've seen them in the clinic. And then they subsequently go ahead and do an endoscopy, and, th and this individual has kind of gross distal esophagitis, do some biopsies, a moderate hiatal hernia, and, uh, and uh, a normal uh, sleeve uh, gastrectomy. So the question is, what do you do for that patient? Well, I think. Um, it's important uh, to recognize that a subset of patients who undergo sleeve gastrectomy are going to need revisional surgery at some point for uh, gastroesophageal um, uh, reflux. Now, the question is, is what percentage is that? There are a lot of personal experience and series out there that are on the kind of closer to 1%. Uh, as far as the, we're seeing these randomized control trials that have just all came out in the last year, it's actually closer to 10% of patients that are being uh, converted to another operation uh, because of their reflux uh, symptoms. And so what, you know, what to do, what that second operation should be is, again, a point of discussion amongst bariatric uh, surgeons. Um, there are reports of uh, operating on the stoma stenosis, or if there's a hiatal hernia, you can do a, do a fix the hiatal hernia. The, the problem that many of us have with that strategy is that uh, about half your patients are going to be happy, then there's going to be another half your patients that the, the outcome is not going to be particularly satisfactory. So then you're talking about redo, redo operations, which in the world of uh, foregut surgery and all surgery, I suppose, is, is uh, uh, dreaded because all of a sudden the, uh, the morbidity of the operation starts going up. And so that's why most authors uh, recommend that if you know if a patient who's had a sleeve gastrectomy and they do have uh, reflux, that uh, that you consider at the redo operation, the first redo, to, to convert them to a rheumatoid gastric bypass, recognizing it is a well, uh, very effective operation for gastroesophageal reflux, it has the added benefit of potential uh, additional weight loss uh, as well. What about band revision options? There's certainly a lot of bands that are still out there, and uh, anyone who does bariatric surgery will be taking them out for, for a few years yet. Um, and it, it, one of the very common presentations of that is intolerable, intolerable girl, basically, that the, the heartburn is, is just terrible. And so um, in my experience, a lot of them aren't interested in anything else. They, uh, and, uh, I mean, you can talk to them about their options, but uh, it's very effective just to remove their band as far as, a, as, as, far as their uh, GERD goes. Um, uh, that being said, if you have patients that actually have you know, hiatal hernias and this, um, then a simple band removal is likely not going to be uh, effective for them. And then you're going to get into, you know, what your options are, hiatal hernia repair. And it, you just cycle back to that conversation that I just had about uh, sleeve gastrectomy conversions. Uh, if you just do a hiatal hernia repair, oftentimes you end up uh, with the need for original surgery. So you get into that dreaded redo, redo scenario that most of us try to avoid in life. Uh, what about gastric band revisions? Um, any of us who have been doing bariatric surgery long enough recognize that even people that have uh, gastric bypass, a uh, small subset, uh, have bad, uh, severe esophagitis. Um, and uh, the challenge there, from the gastric bypass point of view, is there really isn't a lot of straightforward uh, surgical options for those patients. I think it's really important to kind of review the anatomy of their gastric bypass, make sure there's no, nothing else in the differential that you're missing. But then uh, there's really no kind of, oh, this is what you do in that scenario. Um, so those, those, are, those, are, those are therapeutic uh, in, in uh, clinical dilemmas. There's been a lot of uh, work in the area of endoscopic GERD therapy, particularly that's a subset of patients. There's a bypass, and, and there's also uh, maybe something that you can offer, something with a sleeve gastrectomy. Um, and uh, so, you know, Streta was reintroduced to the market uh, with, with that uh, uh, target uh, uh, patient population. But uh, as, as I think many of you are aware, that just within the last little while, I'm under the impression that Streta is uh, catheters are hard to come by. So that option may just be more theoretical going forward. But there's a lot of work as far as experimental endoscopic procedures, things like causing a little bit of stricturing via endoscopic mucosal resection techniques at the GE junction that 
um, you know, uh, maybe almost forming a, like a, a Shatsky's ring sort of thing that uh, are being evaluated and some preliminary experiences are being reported. But there's no good controlled data uh, at this point as far as endoscopic ear therapy. My last point uh, I wanted to bring up was the need for surveillance. It was alluded to uh, earlier, uh, and there's just been two reports published in the, in the last year that, uh, that suggest that the risk of developing Barrett's esophagus after sleeve gastrectomy is really underappreciated. And it, those authors have actually said, you know, we should be, uh, they sh these patients should be in uh, uh, surveillance endoscopy. I think uh, you, can, you can approach this a couple different ways. Uh, if you look at it from a public health delivery point of view, and, and is it cost effective to do surveillance on people who had sleeve gastrectomies, I would argue that there's not a lot of data to support that perspective right now. But as far as uh, uh, there's a need from a research point of view to understand what the risks are long term from uh, sleeve gastrectomy, I do think, uh, I do think that's certainly a, a concern. So in, in summary, uh, patients can present with uh, early and late onset GERD after uh, bariatric surgery. The uh, endoscopic findings, uh, whether they, you know, their appreciation of their mucosa is very important. Also, the anatomical abnormalities that you might see uh, as far as their hiatal hernias and stenosis is also important to consider when, uh, when thinking about what their management options are. The mainstay for most patients, even if you look at the trial, uh, again, is, is they're managed with medication. Uh, but there's a subset that need additional therapies, and there's definitely a role for, uh, for the right patients for endoscopic interventions as well as converting them to room-wide gastric bypass. And if you do it uh, up front, the, uh, the, uh, you can do it with very minimal morbidity and with excellent clinical outcomes. Thank you.